In this video, I want to provide an introduction to using Gaussian quadrature to do numerical integration. So Gaussian quadrature is a deterministic routine for doing integration, opposed to some of the Monte Carlo methods, which you might encounter elsewhere. And it's a method which is based on discretizing the integral. So the idea here is we replace an integral from, say, minus 1 to 1 of f of x dx with an approximation which is given by the sum of k terms, so we're summing from i equals 1 to k, of some weight evaluated at xi times f of xi. So on the right here we just have a weighted sum of the function values with the weights given at the particular x values. I haven't specified what these weights are, nor what the xi are, and indeed that's what we look for in Gaussian quadrature, optimal choices of the weights and the x's to make this approximation as good as possible. So the idea with Gaussian quadrature is we replace our function with an approximation. So I'm going to write here f hat to indicate that we're using an approximate f. And we start off with the most simple kind of approximation. We might start off with just a constant approximation. And typically that's not a very good approximation for doing integration. So we might include as our sort of first stab also a linear term in x. And then it turns out what we can do for all linear polynomials, we can find the exact x values and the weights at those x values which ensure that this approximation is actually exact for all linear models. We could then apply the given x values and the weights at those x values to our actual function f. So we calculate the f, the functional value of all of those x values that we found. And we could use that approximation to our integral. But the problem with this simple approximation is that most complicated functions that we are integrating or interested in integrating aren't well approximated by a linear model. So what we might do instead is we might include some higher order terms. So we might include a quadratic term and say a cubic term as well. So now what we can do is we can find new x values and new weights at those x values to ensure that the approximation here is actually exact for all polynomials up to those of a cubic order. So now hopefully f hat of x, where f hat is let's say up to a cubic term, is a better approximation to f of x than was say that when we just included a linear term of x. But again, a cubic approximation, a cubic polynomial may still not be a very good approximation to our function. So what we might do instead is we might include higher order terms. So we might include x to the 4 and, let's say, x to the 5. And then we hope, again, that if we work out the exact x values and the exact weights to ensure that we get equality in this expression up here at the top for all polynomials up to order 5, then hopefully we get an even better approximation to our function, and hence we get a, pro a better approximation to our integral. So you kind of see how this is working. The idea is that we approximate our function by a polynomial of ever increasing order, and then we find the exact x values and the exact weights at those x values for a given polynomial order, and we use those to work out the integral. And hopefully if our f hat is a reasonably good approximation to f, then we get a reasonably good approximation to the integral. So now I want to show how we can work out the x values and the weights at those x values for a simple model. So we're going to start off by using an approximation to f, which is just a linear one. So we're just going to have a0 plus a1 times x. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be trying to work out the x value. And there's just going to be one x value here and the weight at that x value, which when multiplied by the function value, gives us the exact integral of minus one to one of f of x dx. So we've got two unknowns here. We've got the unknown, which is the x point, and we've also got the unknown, which is the weight at that x point. So because we've got two unknowns, we need two equations. 
And we can get those two terms because we've got one term which is just due to the constant and the other term which is due to the x term. So starting off with the constant, what we can do is because integration is a linear operator, essentially we're going to say, well, the weight, and I'm just going to write w1 here rather than w open brackets x1, times a given constant value, and I'm just going to choose 1 here, is equal to the integral from minus 1 to 1 of 1 dx, which is just equal to 2. So essentially what we're doing here is we're first of all working out what the weight would be for a constant model. So that's just a model that's just got a zero in it. And we found that the weight at that we'd need to apply at whatever x value is equal to 2. Then what we do is we consider the terms which are to do with x. Then what we have is we have w1 times our new f, which is just going to be x, is equal to the integral from minus 1 to 1 of x dx, which if you work that out, you just get 0, and this should just be x1 here, sorry, which means that if you plug in w1 is equal to 2, you just get out the result, which is that x1 is equal to 0. So what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that what we can do is we can represent any integral from minus 1 to 1 of f of x dx, where f is up to including a linear model in x as being exactly equal to 2 times f evaluated at 0. Why does our method do this? Well, essentially what we've done is we first of all tried it out on all models which are just a constant. It's all models that are a constant because I could replace one here by any number, so I could just have a0 and a0 here, then the a0s would cancel. So we know that the integral works, or our approximation works exactly in that case. And secondly, we know it works for all x terms, because in the bottom here, we've looked at the x terms, and again, I could multiply the x by any number here, and I would still get out the result that x1 is equal to 0. To kind of test this, what we can do is we can say, well, let's try and work out the integral from minus 1 to 1 of, let's say, minus 5 plus 4x dx. And we could do that using our rules of integration. We just get the integral evaluated just becomes minus 5x plus 2x squared evaluated at 1 and minus 1, which if you plug in the numbers here, you get minus 5 plus 2, and then you get minus 5 plus 2, which equals minus 10. So actually following the exact rules of integration, we get minus 10. Let's now apply our rule. So our rule just says we can evaluate this in a much quicker way by just taking the function evaluated at 0 and multiplying it by 2. Well, the function here is just minus 5 plus 4x. Evaluated at 0 is minus 5. Hence, our rule gives us 2 times minus 5, which again equals minus 10. So this is actually pretty neat. This is a way of integrating any linear function in x just by doing one calculation, or two. We need to take the value of f of 0 and multiply it by 2. So I suppose that's two calculations. But anyway, it's a pretty neat way of working out an integral. Now I want to do the same sort of thing, but now I'm going to consider a cubic model in f of x, because it turns out in Gaussian quadrature, you kind of only consider the odd polynomials in x. So here I'm going to have f of x is equal to a0 plus a1 x plus a2 x squared plus a3 x cubed. And what we're going to do now is we're going to work out a linear weighted sum of x values, so w1 times f of x1 plus w2 times f of x2, such that for integrating any polynomial up to order 3, we get the exact result. So we get the integral from minus 1 to 1 of f of x dx. Why have we got two terms here on the left-hand side? Well, it turns out for a more complicated polynomial, we need more terms. Basically, we need one term for each of the different possible polynomial powers in f of x. We've got that because we've got two weight terms, and we've also got two x values at which we're evaluating our function. So we've got four unknowns, and that's going to allow us to find the exact rules for doing integrals for polynomials up to order of 3. 
So we proceed exactly as we did before. We, we consider first the, the simplest possible model, which would be a constant. So now, just applying our sort of left-hand side, we just get W1 times 1 plus W2 times 1 equals the integral from minus 1 to 1 of 1 dx, which is just equal to 2. Then we consider a model which is linear in x. So then if f of x is just x, we get w1 times x1 plus w2 times x2 equals the integral from minus 1 to 1 of x dx, which we already know is 0. Then we do the same for x squared. For x squared, we just get w1 times x1 squared plus w2 times x2 squared equals the integral from minus 1 to 1 of x squared dx, which, if you work that out, just equals 2 thirds. And then finally, we need one more expression because that gives us four equations and we've got four unknowns. So we get for the x cubed term, we get w1 times x1 cubed plus w2 times x2 cubed equals now we're going to have the integral of an x cubed term, which because x cubed is an odd function, any symmetric integral about the origin is just going to be equal to zero. Okay, so now we've got four equations and four unknowns. So what you could actually go and do is you could work out the result, which I'm just going to state here. So it turns out that the weights that you find here, you get that w1 is equal to w2, which is equal to 1. So now we've got a weighting of 1. Remember, for a linear model in x, we had a weighting of 2. And the x values at which we evaluate the function are given by what x1 is equal to minus 1 over root 3, and x2 is equal to 1 over root 3. So again, this is pretty neat. It tells us, essentially, we need to do four calculations to calculate an integral of any polynomial up to order 3. And I should just state again that this is an exact rule for all polynomials up to order 3. It's an approximate rule for polynomials of higher order, or, you know, fairly complicated functions which can be approximated by polynomials of higher order. But for polynomials up to order 3, it's an exact rule. So, for example, we could work out the integral from minus 1 to 1 of minus 5 plus 4x minus 3x squared plus 2x cubed dx. We know that we can work that out exactly if we just use our rules. So now we're just going to have well, each of the weights of 1. If we call this whole thing here f, or yeah, let's call it f of x, then we're just going to have f of minus 1 over root 3 plus f of 1 over root 3, because each of the weights here that I'm having before each of these f's are 1. And it turns out if you plug in each of those values into our function, then you just get out an answer which is minus 12. So essentially we've just done two calculations here. We worked out the functional value at minus 1 over root 3 and that at plus 1 over root 3. So again, I find that a pretty neat result that we've got here. So now that I've shown that we can actually work out the exact rules to do integrations for polynomials of order 1 and of order 3, you might ask whether there is a general result that you can quote for sort of polynomials of, of any order. Technically here we're just talking about the odd order because we're using Gaussian quadrature, but nonetheless we're looking for sort of a general rule here. And it turns out there is a general rule. It's a slightly complicated rule, or at least a little bit complicated to write down, but it turns out there is an exact result and it's using objects which are known as Legendre polynomials. Hope I've got the pronunciation right there. I might not be. And Legendre, he actually came up with these polynomials as a solution to a particular differential equation. And so what we can sort of draw out here is a table where we have n, which is the order of polynomial which Legendre was considering, and the polynomial at that particular n value. So it starts off with a value of just x, then we have a half 3x squared minus 1, then we have a half times 5x cubed minus 3x, etc. But the important part is that each of these polynomial terms is tabulated somewhere, so you can just look it up. So why have I introduced this sort of random thing, these Legendre polynomials? Well, the idea is that if we solve for the solution of 
pn of x is equal to zero, then each of those x values turns out to be, you can prove it by a slightly different approach to the sort of method I used to solve the previous equations, but you can prove, nonetheless, that the roots of this equation tell you the x values for a polynomial up to a certain order. So firstly, considering this x term here, the first uh, order Legendre polynomial, that has solution just x being equal to zero. And if you remember back for a linear model, that turned out to be the x values at which to evaluate our function for our rule. So that seems to give us the correct x values in that circumstance. In the next one, if we were to look for the roots of this equation, then it's fairly simple to work out that we just get x is equal to plus or minus 1 over root 3, which is just what I stated before. And similarly, I could go through and I could solve, let's say, for the, for the third order Legendre polynomial, and I would get a root there, and then that would be, in the case, that would be then for a quintic power rule. So the second order Legendre polynomial here was for a cubic one, just to be clear, the first order one was for a linear one. So the idea is that we can solve quite efficiently for the roots of the Legendre polynomials, and hence we can work out the x values at which to evaluate our function. But that's only part of the story, because remember, we need also the weights at each of those x values. But it turns out there's also a solution here in terms of Legendre polynomials. It turns out we can work out the weight of any xi is just equal to 2 over 1 minus xi squared times the derivative of Legendre polynomial at that xi all squared. So I'm just going to illustrate that this works for our cubic case here, the second case here. Remember that we found the weights in our cubic case just being equal to one another and equal to 1. So let's plug in our x values at, let's say, 1 over root 3. We only need to do it for 1 because it will just be symmetric for minus 1 over root 3. And hopefully we get out that the weights are equal to 1, or the weight there is equal to 1. So now we get a weight which is just equal to 2 over 1 minus the root squared. So that's just going to be 1 over 3 times the derivative of the Legendre polynomial. So the, the second order Legendre polynomial here of x is just equal to a half, 3x squared minus 1, which when I differentiate that, I get, quite simply, just 3x. You can verify that on your own time. It's just basically taking the 2 down here in front, so I get 6x, and then dividing that through by 2, so I get 3x. Then if I square that, I get out here, I'm going to square the right-hand side, and so I get 9x squared. So now, if I plug in 9 times x all squared, I'm going to get 9 times 1 over 3. So if I just solve that, I get, or I simplify that rather, I get 2 over 2 thirds times 9 times 1 over 3. The 2's cancel, and on the bottom here, I'm just going to have 9 over 9, which is 1. So I just get out a weight of 1, which is exactly what we required. So whilst I haven't proved why Legendre polynomials turn out to be the way to find the x values and the weights at those x values for our Gaussian quadrature rules, you can take my word for it or you can Google it. There is a way of proving that this is the case. So now what I want to do is I want to show for a particular example that Gaussian quadrature works. And in doing so, I'm going to hopefully validate that these Legendre polynomials turn out to be the way to calibrate our Gaussian quadrature method correctly. So here on the left top hand graph, I show the function that I'm going to integrate between minus 1 and 1. That's just the blue line here. And we're starting off with a linear approximation to that function. So that's just shown by the orange line here. So the function here is e to the minus x uh, times sine squared 4x. So a function which cannot be written exactly as a polynomial in an x. You need an infinite number of terms to exactly represent that function. However, hopefully what we'll see is that if we reach a reasonable number of polynomial terms, then we can approximate f fairly well, and hence our integral works pretty well. So that's the top left-hand case here. On the top right-hand case, I've got the Legendre polynomials here, shown in blue, and 
I've shown the root of that Legend polynomial, which tells us the x value at which to evaluate our function. And I've shown the weight here, which we get by applying our rule for the weight, which I've shown here. And, and remember before that we found that the weight was equal to 2 for a linear function in x. Then in the bottom left-hand case here, I'm just showing the function again, and I'm showing the value at which we're evaluating that function. So we're evaluating it at 0, so we just get f of 0, which turns out to be 0 here. And obviously, because the function is non-negative, we are underestimating what the value of our integral is because we're just getting an integral of zero here and hence we get a high error which we're kind of showing here by this first magenta dot that I've shown here. Then what we can do is we can work to the next possible Gaussian quadrature polynomial which is of order three and we see on the left here that we're getting a slightly better it's still not a great approximation to our function shown by the orange line here and our Legendre polynomials here now have two solutions, and these turn out to be plus or minus root 3, and the weights associated with each of those are 1, which is shown by the black dots here. And we see that now we're evaluating our function, uh, these two values, and each of these two values is being multiplied by each of these weights, which are just 1, and it turns out that we're getting a slightly better approximation to our integral. So our error, which is this vertical axis here, is decreasing. If I increase the order further, so now we're going to be considering an order polynomial of order 5, we now get a slightly better approximation to our function again. Unfortunately, though, again, our Legendre result tells us that we need to be evaluating the function at these particular values, and it just turns out that the function happens to be 0 at those values, so again we get a poor approximation. But if I increase the order further, you can see that by jumping from order 5 to 7, we're now dealing with a much, much better approximation to our function, and the error is accordingly going down. And so if I increase the order ever more, we can see that our error starts to decrease very rapidly. And we can see that now, as I'm increasing the order, I've got more terms at which I need to evaluate my function, and accordingly, those weights that I'm applying to each of those functional values are, are decreasing as well, and the error is decreasing considerably as well. So we can see that after doing only, if I just stop it there, oh, if I just go back to that, we can see that after only considering polynomials of order 29 here, we've got a very good approximation to our integral. In fact, the, the error rate here is about 10 to the minus 14. So let's just stop and think about that. That's pretty good. Essentially, we have to do 14 calculations here. So let's just think about that a little bit more. So here we've got a polynomial of order 29, which means that we have 15 terms in our rule which we're going to use to approximate our integral. So by only doing 15 calculations, we can get a very, very small error in our integral, which is much, much better than the number of terms that you would need to evaluate to get a corresponding error by using the trapezoid rule. So Gaussian quadrature seems to be a pretty useful way to do integration, at least in one day. One thing I should just say here is that even though Gaussian quadrature is typically defined as integrating from minus 1 to 1, for any finite definite integral, in other words, I'm integrating from A to B, where A and B are finite, then you can always transform x such that a and b are minus 1 and 1. So you can always apply this exact rule which I've discussed here for integrals where the bounds are finite. For integrals which have infinite bounds, you need to use different rules with different polynomials, but the principle is essentially the same. So what's the problem with Gaussian quadrature? Well, there isn't really a problem in it as you apply it to integrals. So what are some of the problems with Gaussian quadrature? Well, one of the issues with Gaussian quadrature is... So what are some of the problems with Gaussian quadrature? Clearly, we can't just have a rule that will work whenever. Well, one of the issues is that if you have singularities in your function, in other words, you have the function tending to plus or minus infinity at a particular x value, then Gaussian quadrature doesn't really work and you need to use a different kind of quadrature. That's a fairly minor concern because it turns out you can use one of these other rules and they work pretty well as well. The bigger issue with Gaussian quadrature is it doesn't really work well in 
higher dimensions. And that's because it's based on the idea that we are essentially discretizing our integral into a finite number of, of terms. And we don't really know how many of these terms we need to include for each of our dimensions. But the idea is that if I have to do that for each of my dimensions, then essentially the number of terms that I need to evaluate goes up exponentially with the number of dimensions in my problem. So unfortunately, Gaussian quadrature just isn't a way of doing integration in particularly high dimensions. There are certainly Gaussian quadrature rules for integrals of a sort of relatively small order, I think up to about two or three, but for higher dimensional integrals, it just doesn't work because it's based around discretization. So in those circumstances, it turns out that using sampling to do integration is a better way of generalizing to integration in higher dimensions. But in that circumstance, we give up the fact that we've got a deterministic routine. We've now got a stochastic routine. And hence, even though our integral is in exact value, it is a deterministic value, we still get a stochastic result for its value using Monte Carlo sampling. 